So here we are, page 208 of the book Fighting for Honor, the conclusion, end of the first paragraph. However, 20th century blade usage clearly suggests that the technical use of the razor was an extension of the unarmed Jogo de Capoeira tradition, according to Jair Mura. The fight with or without weapons did not alter the form or the techniques. So it has a nice illustration here. Like I've been saying the whole time, transferable skills. The fight with or without weapons does not alter the technique. Another martial arts master, just like he, you know, this guy was a capoeista, uh, the capoeira, he yelled cho, the importance of sparring. How can you truly know what a martial art has to offer you? So um, there you go. See how I always give them examples of transferable skills? Uh, so are you talking to me? Yes. Sorry. Um, so can I give you examples of transferable skills? All right, quickly, briefly. Um, so basically, um, like uh, using weapons, using meditation, um, using um, physical strength, mental strength, um, also understand having patient patience um, and understanding I guess understanding patience and uh, I think I said that already haven't I but, um, so yeah just understanding your opponent because it's not all about fighting it's about being able to to see what what is your opponent going to do before you actually interact with them so patience is really important with that that your spiritual side seems to play more of a part because you're trying to connect with their energy and that's where sparring comes in i guess where you're yeah exactly um in page 212, in the bite of Biafra, evil sought honor through individual achievement and the strict adherence of Omanani, or proper custom. Because the spilling of blood could be an abomination against the Earth Mother, evil developed two distinctive, distinct combat practices through which individuals could seek to achieve notoriety. The first was grappling form Mbo, which was in many areas open to all members of society, female and male. One specific substyle focused on leg wrapping techniques, but many other styles of Mbo existed. All of them shared a pacifist approach to combat that sought to avoid bloodshed. Mbo played a crucial role in fertility rituals, life cycle rites, conflict revolution, and distinguishing community aesthetics. Although Umbo was used to establish honor rankings among individuals and communities, strict adherence to moral codes of conduct was necessary for a wrestler to attain the highest of all honors, becoming a transcendent hero. In contrast to this and other forms of bloodless combat in central Igbo land, along Igbo frontiers in the north and west, and among coastal Biafran groups, a second combative tradition of headhunting predominated. In times of peace, the mastery of the machete to decapitate foes was taught to initiates or certain closed societies, and the most prestigious societies, such as Ekpe or Ekpo, required such a feat as a prerequisite for full initiation. When the ancestors sanctioned bloodshed, lethal combat skills were called upon. During the widespread chaos that followed the spread of the Atlantic Strait trade into the hinterland, young people from the borderland areas often travel great distances in order to find an appropriate conflict to execute their skills and gain admittance to the honored class of warriors. Adepts of these were enslaved and forcibly relocated to the Americas where these traditions continued to serve as potent tools in the quest for honor, albeit in radically new ways. So if you following what's going on here is that the evils have a long, long history of bloodshed. And over time, it became taboo to train in unnecessary bloodshed in the um, center land, but out in the frontier land, right? 
Yeah, I understand. Yeah, in the frontier land, there was a lot more trouble because um, they were clashing with other tribes and other peoples. And when the slave trade came, uh, things were, you know, there was chaos. Okay. So it's very much um, a territorial thing. In, in a way, yes. But when the slave trade came, there was chaos and, you know, some of these people in these close societies to become initiated had to cut, cut off someone's head at close range, close combat. So they were going out far away to look for conflicts. They could cut off heads and take slaves in, you know. So, because this was an honored class of warriors, the Ekpo or the Ekpe society, it's a prestigious society. To get into it, you had to cut off a head. And you couldn't do it in a way that was taboo. You had to go out and go to war, you know. So these people pushed, looking for a war that wasn't going to violate their system of honor. You follow me? Yeah. And then they had another group of people that were wrestlers. That, be, you know, they could become transcendent heroes that way. So, you know, you had the, the strikers, right? Going back to what I read before about J.R. Moore... Uh, the fight with or without weapons did not alter the form or the techniques. This was a recurring theme in combat. Unarmed combat and armed combat having the same forms and techniques. You know, uh, I remember one of the foolish guys who tried to, you know, make a diss video against me. He said, oh, the physics are way different in weapons. He didn't know what the hell he was talking about. You know. Well, um. Sparring is that is sparring the one of the most um, highly credited uh, forms of recognition of somebody's skills in martial arts. Yes, to those who are really classic martial artists who truly understand what it means to be a martial artist, to the people who fight in the ring, if you know, automatically they're looking at things in terms of fighting. They're not even thinking about forms which I don't really put a lot of, uh, you know, stock in myself, or weapons, or tradition. They're thinking about, can I beat this guy up in the ring with the rules? You see what I'm saying? And if yeah. and they don't think about things in terms of truly what it means to be a martial artist. When you think about things in terms of what it truly means to be a martial artist, and the transferable skills and techniques um, and forms, you know, then yes, sparring is the most effective and traditional way, hands down, you know, to maintain honor. And you look at that, it's not just the Ebos who see it that way. That's why there's so much sparring gear sold every year in America where, you know, there's more martial arts schools here than in China, Korea, and Japan, I believe, combined. So can, I, can I just uh, sort of ask a question? So do, during sparring, do you also... Um, are you able to test your opponent's uh, patience? In a way, yes. Patience does come into play. But, you know, it's also because carefully the, applied. Because you're sort of observing your opponent to see which way, what, what kind of... Uh, tackle the they're, they're aiming for yeah, there's that and there's a cycle that in that i would um, put in the category of a psychological opponent uh component to it it's more like um super speed chess you ever seen people play speed chess and they push that little thing whatever it is and it's the other guy's yeah. turn you know yeah. this what really happens is it becomes super speed chess once it's set off in motion every movement is connected to the next and to your opponent's movements. It's all connected, it's all relative and relevant. And as time moves on, you're, mo you're forced to make these fast decisions masterfully or you get outmaneuvered, you know, and you have to be, have the mind, body, and soul connection sharp to make it work. Yeah. You know, the soul connection is like, is like this added element that's hard to factor, it's hard to quantify you know how much it's contributing but certainly its contribution is priceless what were you gonna say i was just gonna say though that's that's key isn't it is um how your 
your po opponent um, makes his manoeuvre towards you in mm. terms of being ready, you know, through mind, body and spirit. Um, because if you haven't got those in balance, it could sort of, you could find, let's say, for example, um, your opponent could use phys a lot of physical force on you because they lose the sight of uh, spiritual balance. So they haven't got the patience to actually um, wait until the moment's right. So because they're sort of so they say, right, okay, they're impatient, they start attacking you and using a lot of physical first force in the first blow, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's 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 an element of that, absolutely. There's an element of that. Um But say let's say if both fighters are patient, it it becomes regardless what's gonna happen in every match is that speed chess. It's not just oh this guy is faster than this guy, this guy's taller, this guy is quicker on his feet, this guy's more agile, this guy's more intense this guy's more stamina it boils down to more than anything that exchange you know and it's speed exchange do 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 you know and that's how bat the battlefield is well, yeah i pretty much I, I i've never used that analogy before but i think that's a good one it's like playing chess yeah, super speed chess yeah <laughs> super speed chess but it's pretty much you know, you always have to think ahead of the game. And you have to think about what your opponent's thinking and what he thinks that you're thinking that he's thinking. And That's exactly it. That's what I mean. That's what's happening in chess as well, so... Yeah, and, um... Yeah, there, there's, there's an element of poker as well in that because sometimes you get dealt unexpected uh, things, you know? You don't know exactly what they're going to do. Um, and and when you develop your individual style, you have to consider that. As to where, you know, nothing, you take nothing for granted. So you have to keep a poker face because you are you can't allow your opponents to see any. Yeah, to read you and your moves. Um, you know, and your moves, you know, you have to do it in a way where it's hard for them to know what you're going to do. And there's many different ways that the martial artists go about it. You know, you know all, all their styles have different ways where they kind of conceal their moves slightly. But, uh, you know, let's wrap this up, you know. I just want to touch on that briefly that all these things I talk about, transferable skills, and the emphasis on sparring, you know, all the, the, the true experts, they agree with me on it. It's, there's no question about it. And uh, one of my plaques that was made says, you know, actual combat arts, not sports fighting. I put that in the plaque and I put that plaque up time and time again. So, you know, as we wrap this thing up, um, yeah, I think I deserve my rightful place. And, you know, I know no one can beat me the way they described and I've upheld the moral code. And so it's really up to God you know, to God to, to see what happens next. But, you know, God decides who gets what place where. I know for sure, though, in heaven, I'll be rewarded for doing what uh, no martial arts in American history has ever done and almost none of them could ever really even imagine doing themselves. Any last thoughts? No, I completely agree. I just, I think you've got four days to go and I think you'll remain the top martial artist in America. Um, uh, we're, out think, we're out of time. 